Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at and trying to repair this computer right here. This machine is an illegal or illicit copy of an Apple II Plus, and it was donated to the channel by viewer Mike and shown on Super Mini Mail Call episode number 68. If you haven't seen that episode yet, I recommend you might wanna check it out first. There's some background information. Plus, I do some rudimentary testing on this machine in that video where I figure out that it doesn't work. So in this video, I want to talk a little bit about what these clones are and then try to repair this machine. So without further ado, let's get right to it. So what you see here on the bench is one of my Apple II Pluses, and this computer was, of course, the basis for that clone machine. And the II Plus itself is actually uh, the successor or the slight evolution of the original Apple II. There's actually really not a lot of difference between the two and the two plus other than the badge right here and uh, the power light right here on the keyboard. But really all Apple did is they upgraded the ROMs on this and well, that's really it. So an Apple II, an original Apple II can be upgraded to be a two plus by simply switching out the ROMs for the two plus ROMs and then you have a two plus. Now we've looked at many Apple IIs on the channel in the past. And the one thing that's really cool about this computer versus, let's pop the lid off here, versus the other contemporary machines of its time is it has eight expansion slots, which very easily allow you to add peripherals like floppy drives and other things. And it's tied directly into the processor. So of course those run at the full speed of the CPU, which happens to be a one megahertz 6502. In addition, there's also color graphics and a built-in speaker with sound also two things that the other two machines didn't have. In fact, the PET and the TRS-80 had no graphics at all, and all you could do is use text mode, little box and characters to try to make your graphics. In addition, the motherboard had 48K of RAM that you could expand up to, but you could also add cards to expand the memory beyond that. Here in North America, the 2 and the 2 Plus was a very popular machine in the late 70s into the early 80s. And consequently, there were other companies out there in the market that wanted to get in on the success of this computer. So they tried to make clones of the Apple II. And let's look at a couple of them. And here is one such clone. This is the Franklin Ace 1000, which I've shown on the channel a bunch of times. This is an Apple II Plus clone. And like the Apple II Plus, you can pop the lid off and there's the inside of the machine. And as you can see, this has a similar expansion slot layout to the two plus and it's fully compatible with the cards and the peripherals from the apple II line there are some extra features that this thing has that the regular apple II plus doesn't have like it has built-in 64k of ram on the motherboard which copies the way that the 64k or 16k ram expansion for the apple II works it does some bank switching to take the 48k on the motherboard all the way up to 64k so that's just built in the motherboard there is also lowercase support on this computer, which the Apple II Plus did not have. And it has a fan in this large power supply here, which is also a switch mode power supply to give the case some cooling. The original Apple II and the II Plus relies completely on convection cooling, which means that things can bake a little bit inside the computer. Now, from a legality perspective, the Franklin is actually a legal copy of the Apple II. And there's a lot of lore as to how that happened. And of course, Apple tried to sue them to stop them, but it turns out that the ROMs on this thing were, I guess, created in a clean room environment, much like Compaq did for the IBM PC clones. So Franklin was able to withstand the lawsuits from Apple other than some losses in the courts for the way the color system works on the Apple II that this machine violated this machine, there's a later Franklin Ace 1000, has the workaround. There's an extra circuit board in here that allows it to have color graphics that, in a way that doesn't infringe on Apple's patents. So Franklin sold these machines because of their legal status for a good number of years, and it wasn't uncommon to find these in schools. In fact, this one here has a little engraving around the keyboard here that shows that this was used in a school district as well. And that obviously took some profit from Apple, but I think for the most part, they still sold far more original Apple machines than these Franklin Aces. Franklin did continue on to make some more clone machines, including one that had a detachable keyboard. It looked a little bit less like an Apple II, a little bit more like a PC, but unfortunately the company didn't survive even after trying to make some PC compatible machines and um, well, they're gone now. 
And then what you see here is another legal Apple II clone. This is the Laser 128EX. There were several of these machines as well. And you can see the form factor of this has a built-in disk drive. It's very much like the Apple IIc. In fact, it even has the same little handle on the back here and a whole slew of ports and it's portable, so to speak. This particular model, the EX, is actually a bit more capable than even the Apple IIc because it has actual RGB output and it can run, I think, up to four megahertz. Not to mention it has one expansion slot on the side, while the Apple IIc doesn't have any. These laser computers were made by the Taiwanese company called VTech, which partnered with Central Point Software here in Portland, actually, to make the ROMs for this thing. And they did it also in a way that was legal and withstood all the lawsuits from Apple. These were sold typically inside Sears and big box stores like that. And you could see them on the shelf in their box with all the specs printed on it. So it would be very enticing and cheaper than the Apple computer. And generally, the compatibility was 100% or near 100% with these machines. Now that brings us back to this machine, the machine in question. I have no idea what company actually made this. I can tell that it was manufactured in Taiwan, which is where a lot of the illegal clones came out of. Now, what makes this illegal versus the other two machines I just showed is that the ROMs on this are just strictly copies of Apple's ROMs. They might change something like the banner where it says Apple II at the top, but other than that, it is strictly a byte for byte copy where they basically stole that code. As far as the motherboard layout goes, well, that part of it is just using off-the-shelf chips because that's the way Apple did it. Everything was just off the shelf on the original Apple II and the II Plus. So they weren't actually copying any custom chips because you could just take all the TTL chips and all that stuff and put it together in the same way that Apple did. And you can't really copyright that. Now here's the motherboard that's used on this particular computer. As I mentioned, what makes this illegal are the ROMs. This is just strictly gonna be a copy of Apple's ROMs. Now, if this company had worked with Franklin or Laser to use their ROMs on this, then it actually would have been okay to sell. But of course, Laser and Franklin, they want to protect their intellectual property as well with their cloned ROMs, which were illegal, and they didn't want to distribute those to other companies because if they did, then one clone maker like this one could try to undercut Laser or Franklin and eat into their market share, which of course was a little piece of the pie from Apple's market share. Now, I don't know a whole lot about what was going on in the early 80s when this motherboard was likely made, but it seems like there were different companies making different clones, and they were probably throwing together like commodity parts in this clone marketplace to make these clone computers. So I doubt there was just one company making the cases and making keyboards and making these motherboards. I have a feeling the plans leaked out and there were lots of companies who were making these motherboards and cases and keyboards and whatever and putting them together and selling them in the back pages of magazines for a really low price. Now, from my understanding, what happened is Apple went after all of these companies with a vengeance. And of course, they tried to go after Laser and Franklin, but didn't succeed because of the ROM clean room, redesign, re-engineering kind of thing. But with these, it was really easy because these are blatant copies and they were able to sue these companies, well, at least pull all these computers from the market. And I've seen some photographs out there from old magazines in the old days showing Apple having a big lab filled with these clone machines where they were validating what parts of the motherboard were copied so that they could then go after the companies and get those things pulled from the market. And they worked with the Federal Trade Commission and Customs to literally seize these computers at the borders. But that didn't stop them from coming into the country, which obviously we have one right here. And even look, it looks similar to an Apple II, although, you know, not exactly. It's kind of a cheap case, but the back looks the same. The side looks similar. And of course, other than this number keypad on the front here and a little bit different layout, you know, this is very clearly an Apple II. And then when you look at the motherboard, well, there's just no question that this was a clone. And I can't deny that I absolutely love that these things exist. Now, there's no information about how many clones exist, like how many different clones, or how many were sold for that matter, because all these little companies were basically just importing small batches of them and then selling them to end users in these little ads in the backs of magazines. And then Apple would go after them and sue them out of existence. And when you look at a computer like this, there's no brand names on here. There's no stickers on it. There's nothing on the motherboard. There's really nothing to tell us when this computer came from and who bought it and who sold it or any of those details. Now, when it comes to repairing this computer, I figure it's not gonna be that difficult because this motherboard is such a copy, a blatant copy of the Apple II Plus motherboard. So schematics exist for the Apple II Plus, plus there's a lot of technical documentation for the original Apple II and the II Plus that should help us diagnose any of the circuits that aren't working properly on this computer. 
Now in the mail call video, when I was taking a look at this motherboard, there's something about it that seemed quite familiar to me. And then I realized I have this. Now what this is, is a motherboard that's unpopulated and schematics that someone gave me at VCF Midwest last year in 2022. And pulling this out of the bag, it's exactly the same motherboard. And I don't mean like similar, I'm talking exactly the same in every way. This one here is just obviously unpopulated as you can see. And we have the actual original schematics for it as well. And remember I mentioned there were some slight changes that took place on the motherboard to facilitate like the ROMs and stuff that are different. And there they are. It's a photocopy of a photocopy, so the quality is not perfect, but I've gone ahead and I scanned both the schematics and this PCB here, so that could help in troubleshooting the broken one here. Now, I think what might have been happening here as, as the clone makers were sued out of existence by Apple, or at least shut down, there was probably a large stock of these unmade PCBs, and maybe they figured that they could sell these on the market for a cheap price to hobbyists who could then try to accumulate all the parts here to build their own system. And all you had to do is go to your friend's house who had a regular Apple II Plus and copy the ROMs off their machine and burn those onto EEPROMs, if you knew someone with an EEPROM programmer, and populate them on your machine here. As I mentioned, no ICs on here are custom and everything was run of the mill, off the shelf parts you could just buy from DigiKey. So I have a feeling that's what's going on here with this PCB. So check the description for a link to archive.org where I've uploaded the schematics and high res pictures of this PCB. In fact, what I went ahead and did is I used GIMP to overlay the front and back of this, which really can help you in actually tracing things because uh, things go through vias and they switch sides as it moves around the motherboard and allows you to trace that. So I've uploaded that file there as well. So I think it's time to move over to the bench and start fixing this motherboard. We are over on the bench. I have the motherboard set up. We have the appropriate documentation ready to go. So this is the Apple II circuit description, basically the best book ever written. If you're gonna be troubleshooting or wanna understand really how the Apple II and the Apple II Plus work. I also have my high resolution scan of the schematic for this. I mean, I say high resolution, it's not that high resolution, but it's good enough that I can read it, which is gonna help us if we need to decipher any of the difference between this and the actual Apple II. And then of course, we're gonna be using the oscilloscope because we're gonna be probing around to see what's going on with this computer. Now, in the Super Mini Mail Call video, the power supply here, which incidentally is made by Seasonic, yes it is, I serviced this, which servicing didn't really mean anything. I just sort of took it out and inspected to make sure everything looks good and it does have a hole here in the bottom that allows you to adjust the voltage without taking the power supply apart entirely. Now, if you haven't watched that first Super Mini Mail Call video, you'll notice there's a good amount of corrosion on this and that's because, well, the bottom of the computer must have been exposed to a bunch of water and it got very rusty. Seems like someone in the past has gone and tried to like clean it up by spray painting it, rebuilding it, so to speak. Um, but whatever, it's good enough. Luckily in the power supply, the PCB is mounted on the top, just like it is in the original Apple II power supply. So there's nothing wrong with this thing. It actually just works perfectly. So let's just quickly take a look at this motherboard just to kind of get the lay of the land. We have the expansion slots over here on the right. We have the CPU there with the bus transceivers that connect it to the rest of the systems. We have the ROMs, which are EEPROMs. In this case, these are the copied ROMs. We have 48K of RAM, which is populated on this system. The character generator is there. The keyboard connects there. The joystick connects there. Here's the video connector for the composite monitor. And then we have the cassette jacks here for in and out. And then various TTL logic chips to support operation of the computer. And this does have these little breadboard areas, which we talked about in my last video on this thing. I guess they thought they had some space. They would make a little hacker space available right on the motherboard. Incidentally, there are some jumpers on this motherboard. You could see a couple there and there are some down here and a couple there. And you can put either blobs of solder on there or cut the trace between them. And I'm not 100% sure what all of these do, but looking at that schematic, I noticed that there are ways to convert this motherboard into 50 Hertz operation. Taiwan and other markets uh, typically use 50 Hertz television signals, so you'd wanna run this in 50 Hertz mode. Now looking at the schematic for the clone board, here are the two jumpers, at least the two that I can see immediately for 50 and 60 Hertz. We don't know where they are on the actual motherboard, but all we have to do is just trace where they're going to for these various gates, and then we should be able to locate them. Let me just quickly do that, and actually I'll just mark that on the board here. 
And switching over to GIMP, I have my scan of uh, both sides of the PCB. And you can see here that allows us to see the traces on both sides. Very handy for figuring things out on this board. So row B is right by the end of the motherboard, or the bottom of the motherboard, and 14 is gonna be way over on this side. I guess it's, uh, that's, it's there. So this will be B14, 74 LSO2, which matches the schematic here. And specifically, we're looking for pin two and pin 11. And that right there is pin two, which is one of the jumpers. All right, so you see there, it jumps across there to that via, turns back on the top side of the board, and then goes back to the bottom side of the board and it's running its way up here to there to there. That's it right there. In fact, uh, let's hide this side. Nope, hide this side. Yep, okay, it's going to both of those jumpers. So to go to 50 Hertz mode, I'd have to cut that one and put a solder blob on there. And zooming out, that is the chip there, and right there is the 50, 60 Hertz. So I'm just gonna write 50 slash 60. I'm on a little tangent here. This has nothing to do with troubleshooting this board. I just wanted to figure out how to uh, change that 50, 60 Hertz, just so I can fool around with it at a future time. Okay, it's right here. There's another via that it's going through. So we switch over there. There it is, okay. So it's going to these two jumpers. There's an extra jumper right there, but it's that one and that one, which turns out to be this set of jumpers right here and this set of jumpers right there. So if you have one of these clone motherboards and uh, we well, are looking for the 50, 60 Hertz there to switch it over, there you go, it's right there. Okay, thanks for indulging me. Let's get to some actual troubleshooting. So the very first thing we need to do is make sure that this thing is actually outputting some video. I talked about this in the Super Mini Mail Call episode that Apple II motherboards, when you power them up, the circuitry that displays your graphics or your text on screen is running all the time. That doesn't require the CPU or any other interaction from the ROM for it to at least display text. That's the very first thing that starts happening and you should be seeing some garbage because that's what's in RAM when you first initialize the computer. You're gonna need working clock signals for that to work. And I did validate in the last video that we're actually getting valid clock. Like the CPU has a 1.02 megahertz clock, which is perfect. And in the last part, there were some issues with this little clock circuit down here in the corner. Like the two uh, transistors were sort of loose because they were just stuck into sockets. So that's all working. And um, yeah, we had a valid clock on the CPU. So that means that the video circuitry should be displaying something. Let's start with the schematic here for this board, which of course is gonna be very similar to the Apple II. And when we zoom in, we have the video output, which is the RCA jack that's right here on the motherboard. And it goes through a potentiometer. And what I didn't do in the last video is check that the potentiometer is working or whatever. In addition, we should be seeing a composite video on this aux connector. And that actually happens before the potentiometer. So if that potentiometer is bad, that will affect the RCA jack, but that won't affect the video signal on the aux connector. So I wanna see if this thing is outputting five volts or thereabouts. So yeah, we're getting 5.04 or 5.05 volts right now on the five volt rail. And we're getting minus 5.3 volts on the minus five rail, which is good. And then what I wanted to see is the minus 12 volt rail. Yeah, we're getting 12.1, which is also good. And then here we are on the 12 volt rail and we're getting 11.9 volts, positive 12 volts. Okay, so I'm just validating the power supply is working correctly and it is. So I'm touching the oscilloscope probe to the center pin on the RCA jack, we're just getting, looks like 2.64 volts. There's no video signal there whatsoever. And I'm gonna say it's not a problem with this potentiometer video gain there because now I'm connected to the aux connector and you can see that that's just a solid 3.9 volts. In fact, if we connect up to the video pin now and I change this potentiometer, yeah, it's just gonna move that signal up and down. So this Q3 here is not getting any video signal. And that's weird because there are three signals that combine to create the base drive for this transistor. We have composite sync, color burst, which won't be active right now. And then we have the video signal itself. Are we really not getting any of those things? Now I'm on the collector of Q3 and we are seeing 4.74 volts. And here we are on the base and we're getting 3.91 volts, which is exactly what we're getting on the output of the transistor. I'm wondering if this transistor is shorted. Now the base drive is connected to the transistor through these resistors. So if the transistor is shorted in a way that's just kind of pulling up the base to, well, 3.9 volts all the time, let's look at these resistors and see if on the side that faces the driver ICs, if there's a signal that's visible. And one thing that's super annoying is while the schematics show RA and a value, the only thing that's written on the board in the silk screen is the value. So what I'm doing is I'm using my multimeter here and I have it set for continuity and I'm just trying to figure out which resistors go to the base. Yeah, okay, so I'm on the base. These are the three resistors right there. So perfect, let's turn the power back on. Make sure that we have that. Yep, we do, we have that voltage there. So let's look at this side of the resistors. Okay, yeah, see? 
I think that transistor is shorted. So we have definitely something going on there and something going on there. And what about this one? That one doesn't seem to have anything, but that's okay because that could be the color burst, which is not enabled right now. 3.7K or 2.7. Yep, that would be the color burst, I think. I wouldn't be surprised if this is a video signal right here. Yes, and I'm gonna say this is a video signal. Unfortunately, it's not triggering off anything. And let's look at the sync one. And there we go. This is the composite sync right here. And you can see occasionally it's got a little dip there. Okay, so what this is telling us right off the bat is that video output transistor is shorted. So that's why the video is not working. Let me pull that out of the board and swap it out. In fact, um, in fact, does it say what kind of transistor it is? Yes, 2N3904, I think. I think that's pretty run of the mill. I should be able to find a replacement for that. Alrighty, it's out of the board and it's labeled as C1850 NPN transistor, which I happen to have another one of the exact same part. So let's pop this into the tester here and let's see if this tests and says it's a good part or what. Oh, it does say it's good. Ah, uh, I'm a little confused. I don't understand how that's working or not working. Well, let's compare it to a new one. I assume it's just gonna look the same. Yep, this one is the same. There's just not a lot going on with the circuit, so I'm not sure what's happening here. Everything on the left, we have a, a signal visible, and everything on the right, which goes to the base of this transistor here, all we're seeing is that 3.9 volts. What? Let's, uh, let's turn this on without the transistor installed. And yeah, I mean, we're not getting anything now. So this is the output here. Nothing, nothing at all. And if we look at the side of the resistors, yeah, this is the side of the resistors that faces the base of that transistor. And we're now getting a correct video signal. So that's all the various signals combined, the sync, the color burst, and the video signal. And it's working. So my only assumption is that transistor was bad and heating it up by desoldering it has made it work again. So I'm gonna install this new transistor in here. I just need to make sure I do it correctly. Pin three is the base, two is the collector and the emitter. So the emitter pin one goes towards that side of the motherboard. Alrighty, I replaced that transistor. Hopefully I have it in the correct orientation. Oh, yep, there we go, we have a video signal. So this is on the uh, output of that transistor and the potentiometer raises and lowers the signal, which is what it should do. And what I'm looking for is about one volt peak to peak. So I'll just keep turning it down till we get about one volt peak to peak. There we go. So that was a bad transistor. It just started working when I heated it up, but <laughs> first problem right there. Okay. I think what we need to do now, I just turned the power off. We need to hook a monitor up and look at what this thing is doing exactly. I have a feeling it's just showing garbage. It is definitely not showing the Apple prompt. You can kind of tell that by looking at the video signal, it would have the sync and then it would have mostly black. Cause remember it would be a black screen with just the Apple II at the top. So this system is definitely not running properly. So there's other faults on this computer. All right, the blue screen is the retro tank, you know, my favorite video capture device. Here we go. Let's see what we see here. Uh, we're getting nothing. Oh, I think I'm on the wrong input here. Ah, yes, I am. There we go. Okay. Oh, wow. We are, we are getting some color there. <laughs> so that is not what this should be doing. It's kind of stuck in a uh, low resolution mode there. So the soft switch that controls the graphic mode is in the wrong state. As far as I'm aware, when the system powers up and the reset circuit is working, well, maybe the reset's not even working. I forgot to check that. Uh, what happens is it should reset all the soft switches, which should go to text mode. And clearly we're in the low res mode with color here. Let's turn this off and on again. Yeah, and it's funny how the RAM is changing too. I'm wondering if there's just faults in this RAM. Could be, this is like a weird brand of RAM and this 416 stuff may not be working, but I think there are multiple issues here. I need to go find that reset circuit because I'm pretty sure that reset circuit should reset the state of the soft switches, which should take it out of graphics mode. So maybe the system's not resetting. And actually if the system wasn't resetting properly, then the CPU would never run either, which could explain what's going on here. Okay, so down here at the bottom is the 6502 and there's the reset pin, it is pin 40. And let's just check that with the oscilloscope. So I'm on pin 40. Remember 6502 is active low reset. So when I hit the power, it should stay low and then go high after a split second, maybe like half a second. Nope. That is a non-working reset signal. So <laughs> next problem to solve. Actually, I'm so what I'm going to do actually is I'm just going to pull the CPU out of the socket because that could be, uh, 
you know, what if this chip is bad? Who knows the quality of any of these chips in here? So CPU is out. Let's check pin 40 again and see if that, uh, it being held high had anything to do with the CPU. Nope, nope, definitely not. Okay, put the CPU back in. So now we gotta find where the reset circuit goes, oops, on this uh, schematic here. It looks like here is the reset circuit. Now, there's a whole bunch of chips and things that go on the reset circuit. So it could be any of those that are causing a problem. So it looks like it's an <laughs> another transistor that generates the reset circuit. And I think it's all um, based on a 555 timer. Yep, there it is, 555 timer. <sighs> so it could be that this same crappy Q5 transistor, which is just like the video one, is also bad. So what we need to do is look for R14, the 1K resistor that is connected to the base of the reset circuit. And let's see, just like on the video, if we see a reset circuit that's driving properly and it's just the transistor that's bad. So just like on the Apple II Plus motherboard, the reset circuit is right here. There's a 505 timer. There's that little transistor that could be problematic. And uh, this must be the resistor. So let's probe around and let's see what we have going on on the base here. So that's got nothing happening. And how about on this side? Let's turn this off and on. Yep, same exact problem. Did you see that? It starts high and goes low, and that's because uh, it's inverted basically, because of the way the uh, transistor there uh, inverts it. So yeah, I'm gonna say this transistor is bad in exactly the same way, and that's because on this resistor, R14, on the right side, which is what comes from the 555, I see the signal correctly there. But on the left side, which is what faces the transistor on the base, nothing. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is shorted to ground, kind of like the video transistor was shorted to five volts or three point whatever volts. So out comes this and maybe we'll have a working system. Okay, the transistor has been replaced in the reset circuit. Unfortunately, no, it's not that one. The lead came off while I was desoldering it, one of the leads. So I can't even test that, but pretty much I can be sure that it was bad in the same way. And while I was looking, and now that I've had to change two of those 1815s, I did find another one right there on the board. I don't know what that one does, but that's another 1815. There's another transistor over here, which is probably for the cassette circuit. That's not an 1815, and I don't know if it works or not. And then we have two transistors over here in the clock circuit, but we know the clock's working because we had a good video signal, and we would not have that if we didn't have a working clock. Alrighty, everything's reconnected. Let's see if reset is working. I'm on pin 40 on the CPU. Yes, that looks good. Okay, uh, let's switch over to the video. Maybe, just maybe, we have a working system. Okay, here we go, everyone. Oh, wait a second, we lost everything. Um, I wonder if we lost the clock. I'm on the clock input. Yeah, we have no more clock. Okay, so obviously flipping the board around, I fiddled with this clock circuit over here. And that must have caused an issue. Could be that those transistors were on death's doorstep, I guess. Let's see if this is working. No, we have no clock. Oh, oh. All right, so here's the clock circuit right here, and it seems to be having an issue again. So if I pull these little transistors out, they are in, uh, they're in little sockets there. I should put deoxid in there. But first, let's take a look at the part number on here. Nope, that is, that is not the 1815 that we have had failing everywhere. So, okay, both the transistors were pulled out. I put deoxid in there and let's see if the clock is working. Yep, okay, we have working clock again. Very flaky over there. Let's plug the video in. And now let's see if we have video. And remember, it goes back to what I said, without a valid clock, there's no video whatsoever. You're just gonna have nothing. So the clock circuit has to work on the Apple II for any video to work. And you don't even need a working CPU for the video to work. And I think, you know, without the reset working, then we were gonna be stuck in the wrong mode. And here we go. Okay. Well, that didn't change anything. We're still dead in the water. Um, okay, well, <laughs> I can't believe the number of faults that this thing has. At least we're getting a, you know, a, a video signal. Let's just check what the reset signal is doing now. Let's make sure reset is actually functional. Yeah, it's high right now. Yeah, reset is definitely still working. I just checked it on the oscilloscope, but we're getting exactly the same fault there. 
All right, I took a little bit of a break and I went and had dinner. So let's talk about the problem that we're having with this machine. It's always in the low res mode when the machine powers up. I don't think that's quite the right state. So let's investigate what's going on. According to the documentation for the Apple II, the soft switch for text mode needs to be on for the system to be actually running in text mode. If that's actually outputting a zero, that means we're gonna have the low res graphics mode, which is what we're seeing. Looking at the schematics, we have F14, and this is what controls the various soft switch outputs. So there's text mode, which remember needs to be a one or high for us to be seeing text. Let's take a look at what the oscilloscope is seeing on the outputs of this IC here. All right, I'm on pin four, let's turn the power on. Okay, it is low, which is exactly what we would expect for the low res mode. I'm on pin five, low, six, and seven. Okay, so the output of those are all low. Okay, we're on pin one here, it's 4.1 volts. I don't know, it looks okay, I guess. That's still TTL high. Not sure if that's what should be happening right now with the system running. Pin two looks the same. And then pin three, ooh, okay, so the high is four volts, but then the minimum is 900 millivolts, so the peak to peak is about three point something volts. That just, that screams problematic, whatever is happening here. In addition, pin 15 is a clear pin that says soft five, which when we look at that pin, that is just high all the time. What if I power cycle the computer? Yeah, that just goes high all the time. So when that signal goes low, that actually should clear this entire chip, which you think when it's cleared, it should output all zeros. Also, let's go to pin 13, which is this pin here. Aha, well, it had a normal looking signal for a second. Oh, not that time though. Not that time either. Do any of these look normal even briefly? Well, that one sort of starts low and goes high. How about this one that looks screwed up? No, I don't know. This is like a looking really weird. I'm not suspecting necessarily that this F14 is the problem, but these AD lines might be. Now we need to find out where the AD lines are coming from because they are looking a little strange. And um, these are the ROM chips here and they, they are on the ROM chips as well. So let's keep looking. Okay, so there are the AD lines. They're generated by the 1897 buffers that are connected to the CPU. So there's AD 0, 1, 2, and 3. Those are the signals we were looking at that looked a little strange. Now let's take a look at what we're seeing on each side of these bus transceivers right here. So let's go to H5, which I think are these chips right here. We can check that out by going to the schematics here. So, uh, oh, it does, H5, H4. Okay, where are these chips exactly? All right, well, this is one of the differences on this system here. So these are the 1897s right here and it's in the G row. <laughs> so even the schematic here doesn't match. This is the one for this board. It doesn't exactly match, but either way, we should be able to figure this out. Now I do have to laugh because these are the three transceivers right there. They're all different brands. <laughs> one of them is from 1978 here. I can't quite read the date on the other two, but uh, yeah, all three of these aren't the same. So like this system is just like a hodgepodge of chips, which <laughs> is pretty amusing. All right, we are on pin 12, which is right here. So that's A0, this is coming out of the CPU. Okay, there was a little bit of activity for a second. It looked normal. And now we're gonna look at the output pin and same thing, it kind of matches. So that's cool. All right, and now we're on pin four, which is A1's input from the CPU. And wow, just absolutely nothing happening. Oh, there we go. Uh. That looks weird. And let's check on the output of that. That's pin five. And that's really matching what the input of this chip is, is that. 3.3 volts? Oh, uh, you know, I'm sort of suspecting again. I know we did this earlier, that maybe the CPU here is bad. Let's pop out the CPU. And I think I should just stick in another one of these. Does this even have any like markings on it? I can't really read. It does barely have something written on there. Oh yeah, looks like it's a Signetics 6502. It's very hard to read the markings. They're almost invisible. All right, I found a 65C02. This is not one of the newer versions that's not pin compatible. This is pin compatible. Uh, this is a Rico part. I think I took this out of a disk drive or something like that. Let's see how this performs inside this machine. Let's see if there's any difference here. All right, so we're on pin 10 of the CPU, which is address line one. Oh, well, that looks normal. 
So going back to the bus transceiver on pin four, are these pins even connected to each other? Oh yeah, I think I just wasn't getting good contact. There we go, nice square waves. Okay, well that other CPU wasn't running. And let's check the output pin. So we're on pin five now of the uh, bus transceiver. And there we are. So you can't see it, but I can see the computer is doing exactly the same thing. It's just, it's got garbage on the screen. But without a doubt, that CPU, that CPU seemed dead. Very interesting. All right, let's go back to F14 there and take a look at the soft switch output. So I am on pin four, which is the text mode output. And that is low, which is what we'd expect for low res, which is definitely what we're getting right now, even though you can't see it. So let's check pin one and that was actual activity. So the system is trying to do something at this point. Pin two is AD2 and that looks good. And this one, I mean, it's a little messy, but it certainly looks a billion times better than what we had before. Let's power cycle the computer here. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> we're getting, we're getting there, we're getting more signs of life. Let's check uh, pin 13. Okay, there's pin 13, that's AD0, which now at least looks correct. And you know, the interesting thing here is like, we're seeing what looks like maybe normal activity coming from this system. I think the next step is to go and look at the data line. So pins 26 through 33 on the output, and then there's this bus transceiver we should look at as well, just to make sure like the both sides of it look correct. So we're gonna go right to the right side of the bus transceiver. I am on pin one here, which is uh, data line zero. And that looks fine. And how about two, we're okay. Three, four, I'd say that's probably fine. Five, pin six, uh, looks like it's data line five. Seven, looks okay. And the final one is pin eight, which looks okay as well. Now there is pin 11 here, which is an input to this chip. And this controls the direction on that bus transceiver. So it essentially allows the data lines to go into the CPU or out. Now, of course, if it's reading from a ROM, the data lines need to go into the CPU because the CPU needs to read that data bus. And of course, when the CPU is writing, it needs to be the other direction. And we see lots of normal activity there on that line. And I guess for completeness, we should check the uh, CPU side of the transceiver. I mean, I did just put the CPU in, which I'm pretty sure the CPU works without issue. And yeah, I'm just going through these and everything looks fine. Okay, I think I found a problem here, potentially. So I'm on pin 33 on the CPU, which if you look down there, we are on data line zero. So this is the first data line on the CPU. It's doing lots of stuff, which is as expected, the CPU is trying to run right now, right? According to this diagram, it goes to pin 19 on the 74LS245. And that, that is pin 19, which doesn't appear to be doing anything, but we know it's coming out of the CPU. I'm pushing on the CPU and that doesn't seem to do anything. Now, pin one, which is the, the other side of that, has very little activity here, but this, this activity could easily be coming from the ROM chips, which the system is trying to run out of right now. So do we have a bad socket or something? Because obviously the CPU is driving that line, we saw it, and yet we're not getting any kind of uh, signal on the bus transceiver. I think the best thing to do is grab the multimeter here, and I just need to kind of tone that out. Yeah, there's definitely no continuity there. Now, I think I'm making a mistake here. I'm pretty sure that says 19 right there, doesn't it? Yeah, here we are. Pin 33 goes to 19, and then that goes to 1. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be any kind of connection. I can't find it. So let's go to GIMP. So here's the LS245. That's pin 1. This was 19 right there. And you can see there is a trace there coming off of it. And that trace, well, where the heck is it going? It goes over here, over there. Okay, so this is pin 33, and it looks like there's a trace that goes here. Wait, what? I'm super confused here. <laughs> it goes to that pin. <laughs> Wait, what am I? I'm, I think I'm, I clearly am doing something wrong here. This is ridiculous. I am seriously confused here. So data line zero, pin one, <laughs> Let's go back to the GIMP thing here. So there's pin one, which the trace is going off there. And pin one is like mirrored up to this pin. So that's the way, that's the way this thing works. 
I'm counting here to make sure I'm not bonkers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. But nineteen, it goes right there, which is definitely ground, as you can see right here. So why are they grounding pin 19 on this design? And then this is 26, and pin 26 is data line 7. It goes to pin 12. And let's just follow that trace there. It's that top one. And it's going to pin 11. Oh, I just realized this is a different chip. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, 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 okay. An 8304. Oh, people are probably screaming at the screen. This is not the same chip. <laughs> And when we look here, it says 74 LS 245, but this is wrong. Look, 8304. Oh, okay. So this schematic, this schematic is not correct at all. This almost seems more like a copy of the original Apple II Plus schematic. Okay, so I don't think there's gonna be a problem here because we look up the data sheet for the 74 LS 245, which is just handwritten in here. It should actually go to pins 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Not 12 through 19. <laughs> oh, I literally just wasted so much time because I didn't notice that this is a different part. Oh boy. Okay, well, this is where I'm leaving stuff into the video that I, I make mistakes doing. Here's the data sheet for the 74 LS 245. Pin 19 is output enabled, it's active low, therefore it's tied to ground, so this chip is active all the time. <sighs> These are the modifications that this motherboard has actually had to it, which allow it to use simpler parts. You don't have to use that part that's mentioned right here, this 8304, which is a little bit older, obscure part. And therefore they changed the schematic but now I know that what's on here is not accurate. Like these pin counts are wrong. Like this is right, but this is actually the pin out here for the 8304 at the top there. Okay, anyways, time to move on. Those two transistors were bad, but we're still getting a system that is not running at all. And I just went over all the pins on the transceiver and everything looks completely good. Now, what we need to focus on, I think, is this uh, direction signal. So this is it, a pin 11 on the other chip. It happens to be pin one on this chip. So this is what controls the direction. And it's coming out of this gate right here. Now it is gated with phi one, and then also the read write pin that's coming out of the CPU. So let's just check that phi one looks okay. Yep, there's phi one looks completely fine. And then the read write signal coming from the CPU, I think is this, and it goes through a bus transceiver, which, um, oops, I gotta like get better contact on these old oxidized pins. So that's from, so that's from the CPU and it goes to this right here. Okay, so that's the read write signal coming out of the CPU, looks fine. And then that makes its way through that gate, which is gated with Phi 2 to that signal, which I'm assuming looks correct. Okay, so I think everything is, is working with this bus transceiver. So I think the next thing I need to do is go through all the address lines on the left side of these transceivers here. And to save me the effort of trying to decode all these different transceivers and like which pins I go to, I think the best thing to do is get the address lines off the expansion connectors. So here they are right here, AD0 through AD15. Let's look through all of these signals. So this is pin two, that's address line zero. One, two, three, four. I gotta say three looks a little weird. It's got a little extra something, something happening there, which doesn't match how the others looked. So four looks totally normal. There's five, which I guess looks fine. Six, seven, eight, nine, not a lot going on with nine. Let's power cycle the computer here. I don't know, not much happening there. 10, 11, 12, let's scroll up a little bit here. 12, so I'm on pin 14, 13, 14. It's got a little bit of noise there, doesn't it, on the top. And then one more, 15, a little less noisy. And I think this is the read write pin, pin 18, pin 18. So this is address line three again. This is the one that I think definitely looks a little strange. Let's go find the bus transceivers that handles address line three. And let's uh, see if we can figure out how that looks on each side. See if the CPU is outputting that kind of weirdness or what. All right, address line three is pin 12 on the CPU. All right, so I'm on pin 10. So that's coming out of the CPU. And we go to nine, which is that. Okay, I think this chip is bad. 
because the input looks like that and the output looks like that. That is not right. <laughs> okay, we're getting somewhere slowly but surely. So that's the bus transceiver out of the board. Now I have to go find another one of these. These aren't the most common chips in the world, but I think I do have more of them. It's known as the 74LS367 or the 8T97, and these say 8097, but I think that's the same. It's kind of confusing with these older Logic chips. It's a different family than the 74LS series, even though like sometimes there's an equivalent part number. Um, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna see if this chip is actually equivalent. In fact, it actually looks like there's a similar national semiconductor part here right there. So I think we might have, we might be in luck there. Okay, address line three, I'm on pin nine again. Let's see what this looks. No, same thing. Okay, so that implies there's something going on on the other side of that. Yeah, this is from the CPU side and this is the output side. Okay, so this implies that there is something on that line, on address line three, that is causing that, that problem there. And the problem is, is there's a lot of chips on that address line three, a lot. Now it's nice that everything is socketed on this machine. And all I can think to do here is just slowly take out the chips one by one, but that means I have to find them. <laughs> and I don't think there's like any, particularly easy way, except, well, maybe if I use this. Okay, so maybe here, address line three, I might have to just like print this out and then use a highlighter to try to, cause like this is difficult. See how this stuff all like splits off here, goes all over the place? Well, this is the expansion connector, so I know that's not a problem. But address line three here is going into the ROMs. So it could be a ROM problem. So I'm gonna have to just remove all of the ROM chips. Um, let's just do that really quick because I, I wanted to dump these anyways. So let's just pop all the ROMs out. But I think this is kind of thing I'm gonna have to do is just slowly go through everything on the board that uses that address line <laughs> and, then, and then figure out which one it is. Oh, in fact, the reality, what I should have been doing is just taking one chip out at a time. I need to stop. I'm gonna do one chip at a time. <laughs> that way we can... Uh, we can figure out exactly which is the bad chip, which is the culprit as soon as I lift it out. Alrighty, so I'm clipped onto the pin. Turn it on, looks terrible. Let's keep taking things out until we figure out which is the one that's causing this problem. Now what's good is, oh, I keep forgetting to turn it on. Okay, nope, still looking bad. So what's good is everything is socketed. So that means this is possible to do. Now what's bad is if this machine were all soldered, this would be very difficult. You'd have to start, I don't know, cutting chip legs or something like that. Unfortunately, this is just kind of one of the problems. When you have issues on the data bus lines themselves, then it can be really difficult because the address bus goes all over the place on this motherboard. It goes to tons of different chips. And we're just gonna have to keep looking around until we figure it out. Now, this schematic sucks. So I think what I'm gonna do is just to save everyone the, the aggravation of me like <laughs> looking around for this because this is just gonna be a slow methodical process. I'm gonna go do it and we'll do a jump cut to when I find the bad chip. Okay, I looked around. I definitely found a couple chips that were definitely on address line three, took them out, no change. So I put one of the ROMs back in just so I could easily probe the address line three that, that's going throughout the motherboard. And I lifted pin nine on the bus transceiver right here and if we take a look at what we see on pin nine when I turn the system on, it looks perfect. This is exactly what we'd expect to see. And in fact, uh, this is pin 10, which is what's coming from the CPU. And yeah, pretty much matches. So that means with this chip lifted, we shouldn't have a signal on the address line three. Now, if we look at the ROM chips here, here's address line three. It is pin five on the ROM. So one, two, three, four, five. So here we are on pin five. Let's, we're back on the oscilloscope and we turn on the power. What? There shouldn't be anything here because the bus transceiver is disconnected. So it seems like to me what's actually happening here is address line three, that, that signal wire is somehow crossed with another wire on the motherboard. And that's creating that like kind of weird signal we were seeing. It was basically a conflict happening between, between address line three and one of the other ones. So I'm just gonna use the multimeter here. I'm gonna look for a short. All right, so I'm on address line three and I'm getting a short 
to this pin up here. It's right here, pin 11. Pin 11, address line nine, seems to be shorted to address line three. <laughs> Where exactly is that happening? <laughs> Let's just double check again. One, two, three, four, five. So that's address line three. And then right there, 1.2 ohms. <laughs> All righty then. <laughs> the system is definitely, definitely not gonna work like that. So I'm gonna start I guess looking around to try to figure out where this short exists. These are hard problems to find. Um, <laughs> this motherboard here does not have any bodge wires or anything on the bottom. So, <laughs> like if there's a bodge wire that got displaced maybe, <laughs> I would kind of think that that could lead to problems. I guess I'm just gonna have to visually inspect, inspect this board here. So let's see if I can figure out, let's see. So here we are, this is address line three, and that is the short, goes there to that pin. Now it's gonna be the same on all of these, of course, um, you know, because these are all parallels. And I just have to kind of <laughs> look around, I guess, to try to figure out where this short is. Okay, I misspoke a second ago. So address line three is shorted to one of the data lines. Shorted to data line, looks like data line two. Uh, okay, so um, I, am, I am not seeing any shorts, by the way, um, not on the back of the board. I mean, this board's not in great shape, like it was sort of haphazardly assembled, but we definitely have that short, and um, all the ROMs are out, so it's not that. It's not the bus transceivers, because those are these are address only. This is the data line one, so it's not related. It's not going to be the CPU, it can't be, because it's on the this side, away from the CPU side of the motherboard. Um, so I need to look through the schematics, I guess, and just figure out what's on data line two and on the address line three, because presumably there's some chip on here that's on both that's shorting those lines together. And it's like, it's a zero ohm short, or, or there's a blob of solder or something on here. This is gonna be a tough one to find. I think this is a perfect stopping point for this video. There have been several faults I was able to figure out and find on the motherboard, but now we're stuck with one of the most difficult types of faults to find, and that's a short between a couple lines. I'm glad I was able to identify that, but definitely finding these types of issues can be pretty difficult. The positive thing is that this fault would absolutely keep this computer from working, so resolving that might actually just make this thing work perfectly. Let's hope that is actually the case. Watch for the next part of this video. Hopefully that will come out next week where I can actually get this thing working. Although no promises because there's already been a bunch of faults on here and I wouldn't be surprised if there are some more faults lurking within this motherboard. Huge thanks to Mike for sending in this amazing machine. I cleaned it up a little bit and um, well, it looks frankly amazing. So once this motherboard is fixed, it can go back inside of this thing and uh, well, continue to be an illegal clone of the Apple II. In the description of this video, there's gonna be some links to various things, including that video you saw at the beginning where it showed like customs officials looking at various Apple II clones and stuff like that, talking about how it really hurts Apple and that they have to go after these clone makers and stop them dead in their tracks. Anyhow, if you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. It really helps me out on the channel here. If uh, I get more subscribers, definitely increases the reach of the channel. A huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. They literally make all of this possible. Without them, I wouldn't be able to do this channel like I do. So they are all superstars. If you want to become a patron, you could do so with the link in the description below. It gives you early access to videos and some behind the scenes stuff like live streams, perhaps things like that. And I guess that is going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye.